European Parliament here, so not just here in London. And we are very, very, very happy to welcome you all to this event this evening, which we are co-organizing with uh, the Ukrainian Institute in London, Marco Maria, and uh, with the support of the Estonian uh, Embassy. And we are here, we have here the, the, the ambassador of Estonia, who we will present in a moment, uh, Mr. Vilja Dubi. And uh, Maria Montague, as I said, uh, is the deputy director of the Ukrainian Institute. Um, we are delighted to be able to present to you tonight uh, this uh, screening of the making of this wonderful exhibition that we had the occasion to, to open last night and where some of you might have been there. We had uh, lots of other dignitaries who, who, who could be present and we were also in particularly uh, treated to a, to a really heartwarming, uh, moving performance, not only by music, but also by words by, by one of the protagonists of the exhibition, uh, Natalia, who is, I think, also amongst us this evening, and we're very happy to have her here, Natalia. <laughs> we're very warm well welcome. So, um, our, our support for, for, for the people of Ukraine, I mean, is, 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 is very much of, of the parliament uh, expressed in, in many, in many in political, also in, in, in financial ways, but we felt that in order to make, uh, we felt that our contribution here is to uh, support this exhibition, which gives a face to, the, to, 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 to this human tragedy that is amidst in Europe here today. And, and tells the, the individual stories rather than the, the figures and, and, and the numbers. And we very much hope that we can uh, get these stories uh, the widest possible um, audience and, and, and circulation so that it can be shared with, with many, um, be it here in, in the UK, but also afterwards, hopefully, um, in other places in, in, in Europe. So, as I said, we will have a uh, the screening here, uh, which is uh, followed by a, a panel discussion, and we are we are delighted to have with us the 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 co-creator photographer Carl Pokikas, who is who is here standing there. Um, we have the director of the of the documentary Heinika Pico, and we have uh, Katerina Babkina, a Ukrainian author writer, who is. Uh, now here, living in London as well. So, hello, Katerina. So, without further ado, Ambassador. Thank you so much. I won't take too much of your time. And thank you all for coming. I'm so sorry I wasn't here yesterday. Uh, I was in Tallinn. I just came back um, a few hours ago. I see. This says, what would you take? I was in Tallinn because the project of the UK, James Cleverly, was in Tallinn. Uh, we had many, many meetings, discussions, 95% because of Ukraine. And the conversation was, what would you give? Well, actually, being more precise, what can you give to Ukraine so that the Ukraine can prevail and win this war against the aggression? I think it is very important that, you know, it works both ways. This is the story of what all those people who are suffering. My daily job is mostly to help other way so that Ukraine can prevail. Of course, Estonia is small, but like our story tells, it's very similar, unfortunately, in many respects to the Ukrainian one, that Estonia has been alone in the past. And we have many stories like that, unfortunately, also in Estonia. And I think what makes the difference is that you, you are not alone any longer. Ukraine is not alone alone any longer. And I, I think that's why Ukraine is going to be ready. So I'm, I'm also very, very happy that this exhibition is happening. This documentary has been born. So that many thanks to Bob Kikas and David Kapiko as well. And, uh, and also Katrina Babkina that you know that you made it happen. And uh, especially also you know it's a, it's a, a true life stories. Uh, I think that makes a difference. Yesterday morning James Cleverly, the Foreign Secretary of the UK and our Foreign Minister, Mark Zakhanov, we went to a freedom school in Tallinn. 
just lost the point of that. You know, Estonia has about 7,500 7, uh, uh, children who are school age, with a normal school that uh, educates about 640. And the uh, minister spent a lot of time there talking to the kids, children, you understand, you know, what they do, how they cope with that. So I think these are extremely important stories that we all need to listen. So I hope you enjoy. Thank you for coming. So first of all, I would just like to say a really huge congratulations to Helika and Kalpo for this very moving exhibition and as the ambassador um, and Susanna said earlier, it really is just so important to be hearing these individual human stories and being able to relate to what the impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine has been on individual lives. And something else that I really appreciated is the fact that you've told stories from individuals who have been forced to leave their homes since 2014 when the war began, which is a very important reminder for all of us too. So we'll look forward to um, speaking more with you um, about both the exhibition and the film. And I would just like to do a quick introduction of our three panelists this evening. So we have um, Helika Pikov, who is the uh, director of the film that you've all just watched. Um, Helika is a leading Estonian documentary filmmaker and curator and the co-founder of the Simba Balana production company. Helika has directed several feature length documentaries and short films including My Flesh and Blood, which won Best Short Film of the Year at the Estonian Film and Television Awards in 2018. Kalpo Kekas is a celebrated Estonian visual artist and photographer. Um, his work has a special focus on the themes of nature and music, and art critics have often commented that uh, Kalpo's connection with the environment and melody feeds into his portraits, and I couldn't agree more, and I've been really moved by these very vivid uh, portraits as part of this exhibition and interested to learn that um, that you've been photographing uh, a lot of nature and, um, and music I think that really comes through um, in, in, in the exhibition and I believe some of Kalpo's work is part of the uh, permanent exhibition at the Estonian Embassy uh, so those of you in London there's a chance to see more of it there and um, uh, Kalpo has several books uh, published uh, with his photographic collection so that you can uh, discover more of his work um, and finally, we are joined by Katerina Babkina, who is a leading Ukrainian um, writer now living here in London. Um, Katerina is a novelist, columnist, playwright and screenwriter, and uh, her work has been translated into many different languages. Um, her plays have been staged in Kiev, Vienna, Geneva. Katerina has also written several books for children, and um, they are extremely popular in Ukraine. And last year, her book, Cappy and the Whale, um, was published in English translation by Penguin Random House. And um, Katerina was living in Kiev up until the full-scale invasion. So like um, the protagonists of this exhibition, Katerina has her own story of being forced to leave her home. And we're really looking forward to hearing more from you today, Katerina. Um, so first of all, I would just like to ask Kalpo and Helika about the background to, to this exhibition um, and why you felt it was so important to tell these stories. Yeah, thank you for the praise. I, I feel I'm, I'm still blushing. <laughs> it's also very hot in here. So yeah. <laughs> okay, it's hot. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, it's it all goes down to the core, to the human level. I mean, uh, when it started, uh, I probably we all felt that uh, something so fundamentally wrong is happening that what we can do to, 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 to stop it or to help or whatever, I mean, we were all completely lost. I mean, uh, the same day where it started, I was in the woods uh, in the early, early morning and actually I immediately, in reflect of this horror, I actually filmed some still film uh, kind of a shots for another art piece. I mean, I already kind of got emotionally very much um, engaged from the very first sight, from the very first horrible moment. I was kind of a little bit like shaking at the same time, I think. Uh, and then uh, I called to my friends and we organized, uh, we decided that we, what we can do, how we can raise money. We organized a big singing event in Estonia because 
singing is our, you know, our thing, uh, our singing revolution. Uh, we define ourselves through singing, and in May, me and my five friends, we organized organize the Estonia Sings for Ukraine. We had 3,000 singers uh, on together on our singing ground, and we were able to raise 145,000 euros in 35 minutes. So, I mean, uh, I hope it went to the right place, and, uh, and, and, and probably, the emotional kind of a support also had a value. And then I made some art pieces, I helped some photographers who came from Ukraine, and then I started to work on this project because the original idea actually uh, was born already 2016. Uh, they, we unfortunately don't have here uh, Francis, uh, Francis Tano Saunders, who is the, uh, the person behind this original idea, and actually this very same gallery, our first edition, happened already in 2018, and it was much more kind of a hypothetical question at that point, what would you take? And then I called to Francis, actually emailed to Francis, and that said, I mean, now uh, we should, you know, put the same question uh, up again and in a much more realistic way. And that's how it all has been going. I mean, it's, and it, it's just a very personal way of doing something. I mean, I mean, I couldn't look at the mirror without doing this. I, you know, I'm very, every artist has a big ego and I believe my art helps somehow. Of course, it's a bit, sometimes it's a joke. I mean, the, the artists are so sure in their ivory towers that they do their art to help. I mean, but, uh, but yeah, I'm very much hands-on, so long answer, sorry. No, thank you. That was, that was a wonderful answer. Um, Yes, hello. Uh, well, my story is that uh, somewhere in November last year, uh, Kaupa called me and asked, do you happen to know a filmmaker, maybe a documentary director? I was very smart. Very smart. <laughs> That's how I those things, right? Who would of like to <coughs> join like me to? and, uh, and three, uh, two other people uh, to a road trip? Aha, okay, what kind of road trip? Well, it's through Latvia, Lithuania, Poland to Ukraine. Aha, okay. Uh, so he explained the idea uh, of the photo exhibition and uh, Kaupo's uh, gut feeling told that perhaps there might be interesting material, material to be filmed as well. And after a few days, uh, negotiating uh, with my uh, producer as well as husband <laughs> who's sitting there uh, I had a permission to, to join the trip so we went in November uh, we had the first interview in Tallinn Estonia then two interviews in Riga two in Vilnius uh, where we also met Natalia who's sitting there the violin girl uh, then two interviews in uh, uh, Przemyśl, uh, which is a border town uh, between Poland and Ukraine, uh, one of the main uh, gates uh, where the, the refugees uh, pass when they escape or go back home. And then we went to Ukraine and, and spent uh, three or four days there. Uh, we went to Lviv, uh, to Kiev. Uh, me and uh, the others uh, returned home after that, but Kaupo even went further. He went to Kharkiv. Uh, with Donbass, actually. Donbass. So the shots, what you show uh, about the, the broken buildings and these empty playgrounds, these were all filmed by Kaupo. Uh, but the interviews uh, and everything else was filmed by me, and of course the photographs. Um, which, which are amazing, uh, done by Kaupo. I just used a bit uh, visual tricks to, to make them alive. Um, so that's that's how it went. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Helika, and thank you for this film. I um, I really think it's so beautifully made, and that it's never too much, and that you really let these stories just speak for themselves. But the the clips that you mentioned, seeing the um, just uh, destroyed buildings and. I love the animation of the um, of, of Ukraine's borders uh, as part as part of the film too, and it, I think that the photographs and the film um, and of course the curated um, stories uh, that Francis has put together work really really well in combination for us to get this window into 
the human experience uh, um, behind um, the impact uh, that Russia's invasion has had. Katerina, um, you have been very vocal about the experience of displacement both in your public speaking and in your writing and I know that uh, Katerina has been um, and the work that she has done has been a real source of strength for other Ukrainians and also really important for us here in the UK to understand this experience um, um, as to um, I wonder whether you could share your reflections on the film and if you don't mind um, share your own story of, of, of having been forced to leave Kiev. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here and thank you very much for doing what you are doing. I do admire you know people who are not only telling our stories and are willing to support and help but people who, who really like meet people and go there and talk to us and see us. This is a lot and I do understand this is a difficult material to interact with. So thank you very much for this like sensor and big participation. Uh, it was not easy for me emotionally to, uh, especially to see the uh, film because I had this experience myself. Uh, back then my daughter was one and a half year old. It's a little small child but already heavy enough child. I mean this is a child who does not really walk yet, does not stand confidently, so you cannot put it down. But it moves fast, crawling. It's uncontrollable, it does not think, it does not sense uh, danger. So this is someone completely dependent on you, but already heavy enough. Again, I'm gonna repeat this. And I was living <laughs> alone with her when everything had started. Like you said, you know, it was... First, I did not believe this gonna happen. Uh, I'm separated with her father, and in Ukraine we need permission from both parents to go abroad. So, like 10 days after full-scale invasion, we came back from the vacation. We went to, to the seaside with my mom and my daughter. Uh, I had some of, of the rest because I had some difficult life events before. And uh, I was like really focused and balanced on my work, on my child, on my new life. And just, just in case something is happening, I asked her father to sign the permission to, uh, to take the child abroad. And he told me, like, are you crazy? In the middle of 21st century, in the center of Europe, nothing dangerous is gonna happen to you. But I said, like, look what, what is happening at Donbass and whatsoever. And he said, this is not possible because this is not possible. And frankly speaking, I was thinking the same. We had a fight for a couple of days and he signed the permission after all, brought it to me and said, like, okay, just, just, to get rid of your, you know, like, uh, demanding voice, get it? But of course I did not believe this gonna happen. It's a separate question why people did not really have the information on what is going on and what is plans, but we are not talking about this now. And then when it started, like when you see this by your own eyes, it was so, as you said, fundamentally wrong, that I did not believe it gonna last. I was like, okay, there is no reason to leave because this is gonna end tomorrow. Because this is so wrong and so impossible that now, if they did not do it back in the time of the start of this war in Donbass, if they did not do this back in time of uh, occupation of the Crimea, finally now the whole world is gonna react and this is gonna be stopped. Ha <laughs> ha. I mean, we are experiencing a lot of help and solidarity and support, but still. The things are going on and first, I mean, I was kind of forced to leave, actually. We did not have any bomb shelter open next to my house. So I was taken by some people and they took me by other people and they forced me to go to visit one woman who's a reader of my books and she told me, okay, have a big, big apartment, free space for whoever you want, your mother, your, your friend, because my, my director, my agent was with me. And she's also my friend and my, my daughter. Whoever you want, just bring them there. And we have a good bomb shelter in our building. So that was the, the like the core of the invitation. And I was like, I mean, this is the person I don't know. I have a small child. I have my mom, my friend with me. I was like, okay, if something starts, we're gonna come. And she is like, what else do you want to start? I mean, they are shelling the city now. Just here is the spot on the Google Maps and come. 
And so we came there and we spent half of the night in, your, in her welcoming apartment. Uh, her sons happened to be uh, soldiers already from, from back from 2014. They were there at the moment with, with other guys uh, already like having a, a weapons and were in military and they were explaining to people like me what is happening and what probably gonna happen. So the next morning they came, at half of the night we spent at the bomb shelter and uh, you know, I, 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 I'm so lucky my daughter is so small because I work with children and I help now a lot of children, I do a lot of events for children so I see how deeply scared and traumatized are children who were at least like four or five years old. My daughter is a happy animal, at least she was. She did not understand anything. And in the bomb shelter, which is ex-parking with the cars removed, a lot of bottles with water, baskets, which are being used as a toilet, a minimum of light for you don't know how long you're gonna stay there, you'd better save the energy, the light, and some old furniture that people brought from their apartments set up for, for people like with people with children for instance or elderly people to stay and you would have hundreds of people there a lot of people there crowd scared crowd there scared tensed crowd and then in the middle of all of that was my super happy one and a half year old daughter because everybody brought their dogs and cats <laughs> and she have never seen that many dogs and cats at one place before. That was one of the happiest days of her life, probably. <laughs> she was like, she, she did not speak almost nothing. She called the dog Ava, so she would say like, Ava, Ava, meow, meow, Ava. That was a pure happiness, seriously. She did not sense any tension, any, anything, nothing was wrong for her. And then in the morning, guys, um, Came, came, the guys who signed up actually for, for the military already, they came came and told us that they are surra surrounding Kiev. so probably if I have a car, I mean like, yeah, I have a car and uh, like four people who are not driving and not controllable, my mom, my director and my daughter. And he told me, okay, my mother now, she, she's an experienced woman also, she was volunteering for the old eight years. She's gonna go uh, to the western border to bring to the west my, uh, my girlfriend, his wife, and their mom and our dog. So if you can go by two cars, go together, it's safer. Like, if something is wrong with them, you squeeze them in your car. If something is wrong with you, she squeeze those who... She talk, and, and he put it this way, like, you know, just be relaxed. He put it like, they can squeeze in their car those who remain, which means probably not all of you are gonna remain. So it's like better to go by two cars. And yeah, I was kind of already seeing what's going on around Kyiv. So basically, uh, I, come, I, 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 I come from Western Ukraine, so there was a part of my life when I would drive every month to Western Ukraine and back to Kyiv. So I like experienced all the possible routes and all the possible ways. And I also know the Kyiv region quite well because the father of my daughter has another child for mother marriage who does horse riding. So we would go to the stables all over the Kyiv region. So I all know all the you know places to avoid the traffic jams and and so we, we made a route avoiding any city and all the big routes, which basically led us through the forests and small, small, small settlements. Uh, the way that would normally last six hours to Ternopil, uh, six hours if you stop to pee at the gas stations, five hours if you just drive. It took us 22 hours to drive there. We literally passed in front of Russian army and like seeing everything. And you know, you just drive and you have to sing a song because your daughter is a fan of songs. So everybody just seeing the planes and the uh, like rockets flying and singing a song. And you can't keep up with another car and I have a lame car for this kind of adventures. I used to have uh, an old BMW one. It's a small and very low car. It's not the car designed to go in the forest. Uh, the car of another woman was of course like a big 44 uh, Jeep because he used to, she used to go to Donbass often and help soldiers bring, bring stuff, bring weapons. 
but somehow we made it all together, so everybody remained. We did not need to uh, squeeze the leftovers from the other car. And then as we reached the, the Ternopil city, Western Ukraine, I haven't been sleeping already for almost 50 hours at all. I went to sleep at the place of... And you were driving? Yeah, I was Having driving, obviously. Slept. I was the only person who could drive, so, I mean... <laughs> at some point, we took some, somebody in our car on the way, but then she, 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 she reached the place where she can join somebody. At some point, we broke the wheel, and in the middle of the night, the woman showed up from some work workshop took the wheel with her car and came back in two hours, brought the fixed wheel and took an exact amount of how much would it cost, it's like 800 of something Ukrainian money. And I gave her 1000 because it's like, I mean, it's priceless, the service in the middle of the night, in the middle of the forest, in the middle of the nowhere. And she told me, no, 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 and gave me 200 back. Like, no. I only charge what it costs. And yeah, when we reached the uh, Chernobyl city, I went to sleep. I slept for three hours and then the radiant alarm started sounding. So we had to grab the child, put all the clothes on her because it was a winter time and run for ten, like quickly run for 10 minutes to the bomb shelter. And I was like, okay, I can't do this. So we went to the Polish border and in just four days, which we spent in the middle of the field, in the queue of the same cars, full of women and children, we, we, we uh, landed up in Poland. Thank you so much for sharing, Katarina. Sorry, yeah, it was a long response. No, um, I, thank you for sharing. And um, I actually imagine that quite a few of you in the audience either, you know, Natalia, of course, has her own story that has featured in the documentary, but I expect many of you at least have friends who have gone through this experience too. And it's really overwhelming to think about how many people share similar stories. Um, it's over one quarter of Ukraine's population who have been forced to leave their homes, over a quarter of the country's population, and uh, over 8 million who are displaced across Europe, and an additional 8 million who are displaced within Ukraine itself. And it's just, you know, each individual life, um, each individual person that's had to go through this, it's, it's um, you know, everybody has their own story to tell. And uh, it's really important that we've been able to make these stories not just numbers by uh, being able to hold this exhibition and, and see your wonderful film. And thank you so much for so sensitively sharing these stories. And thank you, Katarina, for sharing too. Something that has been striking me, I mean, to be honest, since I began to start working on Ukraine, um, I'm British myself, is the extraordinary resilience of Ukrainians, which is something that has struck me not only since the full-scale invasion, but since I was living in Kiev during the time of the Euromaidan revolution. And this resilience of Ukrainians really struck me in this film um, from the astonishing story of Ihor, who walked 140 miles with his dog um, and describes how the Russian army were trying to kill him every day and he kept going and, and he made it. And, um, and Natalia's story, which was one of, the, one of the stories that really stood out to me of, of her needing to stay strong for her family. And um, I, I wonder, Kalpo Helika, um, whether from doing these interviews you had a sense of, um, of where this resilience um, is coming from. Um, <laughs> I mean, there, it's, it's kind of a question where there's no answer. I mean, it's, <clears throat> who knows where it's coming from? It's, it's great, it's there. I mean, it's, uh, it's very encouraging. It's, it, that, that would be the only answer. I mean, uh, because for anyone outside who tries to help, you know, needs to also see, to echo back that the help uh, would reach someone and also there is a hope. And the hope is definitely there, and I, for, I have never, for a single minute, um, um, lost the hope. And I mean, that's, that's the great thing. And of course, I, I mean, it, it would be a very, very long story, and I'm not sure that I'm the right person to start to, to, to tell you about the rebirth of a nation and all these things. I mean, but it's, <clears throat> there is clearly ground for these kind of stories. I mean, 
probably people there are also surprised in a good way that uh, that how much courage and how much uh, proudness and and kind of uh, resistant and strength there is so i mean obviously i really don't see a, a real answer to this question but we just have to be grateful that it's there um, we did mention that we had um, a translator with us as well, Uliana Osowska, who's a documentary filmmaker herself. That's why I knew her. Uh, we have previously made a film together, a Estonian Ukrainian um, co production called Tales of a Toy Horse. And uh, she explained us all the way when we went to Ukraine uh, the situation that uh, now in Ukraine. There's no difference of uh, being um, a, a normal, usual person or military person. Everyone is a volunteer, basically. Uh, just some people are, they happen to be soldiers at the moment, but they come back and the others go. And there's, there are no borders of that we are civilians and we have army somewhere. They are all somehow related to each other. And all of them, uh, at least as Uliana told, uh, the first weeks of, of, of the war, um, they were trying so hard, if you're not a soldier yourself, but you're trying so hard to help the ones who are really holding the weapons at this moment. So that, that's, that's something very unique, I think. And, and, and also we have this artist, Petro Bevza. Mm. He's, uh, he's, I, I was so happy that he was the last one in our interviews and I also kept him for the film to be the last one uh, because he's the one who hasn't left. Mm. Um, in, the, in the first weeks, yes, he went from Kiev to Lviv for, for some days, but he, he went back to Kiev and he said that I'm not going anywhere because I feel that, you know, as, as long as I'm here and I'm part of this synergy, I'm volunteering, I'm selling my paintings, I'm donating everything I earn to the, to the uh, army, to the soldiers. I feel um, uh, I don't, uh, there's a meaning of my existence, uh, that I can be here and help as much as I can. So that, that's also nice that, of course, many people have left many people have stayed as well we shouldn't forget that and also many have returned yeah even when we crossed the border uh, we saw families with big bags coming back actually uh, they they had been somewhere in europe or somewhere else for a few months but uh, they were returning home thank yeah. you it was also amazing to hear mariana's story of um um leaving herself and then volunteering uh, at the um, polish border and, uh, and I, I know so many Ukrainians here in London who, are, who have so many of their own challenges of adapting to life here and trying to find work and in every spare minute they're doing whatever they can be to be supporting um, the Ukrainian army and doing everything on all fronts as you described uh, to fight uh, in this war. And it's a reminder for us when we uh, feel like this Ukraine fatigue is starting to set in among those of us who don't actually feel the impact of this war directly and uh, Ukrainians don't have this choice. And um, I've been in touch with colleagues who were in Kiev the last uh, couple of weeks have been at the worst time since the full-scale invasion started in terms of the number of drone attacks um, by the um, Russian army against Ukraine. And I mean, people just aren't managing to sleep at all because it's been pretty much every other night that um, there has been a drone attack. And of course, the nights in between, you're expecting one, so people can't sleep during this time, but they're still getting up the next day and working and, uh, it's really, really extraordinary. Uh, Katarina, I, I wonder whether you could speak to this question of resilience and even with your own story, not just from the, your um, the dramatic journey of leaving Ukraine, but what this journey has been like over this past year and a half now and, and where you are drawing this resilience from. Yeah, but I, I mean, I have to say, I have to comment on this that after a year and a half we came up with the understanding that because I do remember those narratives about there is no difference so after losing uh, more than 200,000 lives we came up with the idea that there is a difference between being in the military and supporting them. The truth is that every Ukrainian is now involved in this war, this or that way but 
part of us pay by their time, by their money, by their nerves, by their heart, by their and some to give everything, like life. So there, there always is a difference. So at some point we stopped calling things like cultural front or artistic front or political interna like international connections fronts because the front line is where you give everything and we are just supporting them. But yeah, I mean about the res how do you pronounce Resilience. this? Resilience, yeah. Well, uh, my English is still not good enough to, That's to not be English. But <laughs> <coughs> we kind of do not have another choice. That's probably the secret. What would you do at my place? Probably. What do you do at the place of the father of my child, being a father of two Ukrainian daughters? He waited until I report that we crossed the border of the military action. He waited until the other daughter, who was back then at the Western Ukraine, reported that she's safe and has a place to stay. And he went and signed up in the military, and he is now in Bakhmut. Um, luckily, still alive. Uh, we do not, and all, uh, I mean, probably all of you would do the same at our place. And I have to say something important, unlike the protagonist of the film, who said that he's trying to forget and all that had happened to him, I'm instead trying to remember, because as the other woman said, I always thought of people worse than they turned to be. First, of course, Ukrainian. I have never experienced such a help, solidarity and understanding as we had in that 110 kilometers long queue on the border with no water, no food, no war, minus 12 winter in the middle of the field. People were sharing everything. People from nearby villages will would wake up early in the morning, cook whatever they can and bring it to the cars. All the early ladies with their home teapots would walk along the car and say like hot coffee, hot coffee in the morning, getting up at six o'clock and using literally all the coffee and all the sugar they had in, in the house. And of course, uh, by all the people helping us, by all the people opening their houses, not, not mentioning the borders, and not mentioning what the governments are doing, but all the people going to Ukraine to volunteer, all the people accepting displaced people here in England, in Poland, in Estonia, in all the other country, all the artists, all the journalists, all the photographers doing their job in Ukraine and giving their life for this too sometimes. Uh, this is something I want to remember forever and stay grat grateful forever. All every second of the experience of being in this is super tough, sometimes very painful, but worth to remember because it shows again and again how good people can be, opposite to what Russia and Russians are doing to us. I can see millions of other people participating in our destiny with all their souls. And this is truly beautiful. And this also helps us to stay resilient. I pronounced it well. <laughs> Tiny joke at the end to make you stop crying. <laughs> this, this does work. Whatever you are doing, I don't mean again the embassies or governments, but personally all of you is seen is recorded in our hearts and is really important. We do see this and this helps us. Every small piece of clothes you are donating, every day at the spare room in your house you let somebody in, every lesson, every food, every possibility, every help you are opening either to Ukrainians who are wounded and coming to get rehabilitation from the front line, or people who are only going there to fight, or people who are displaced trying to save their lives and their children. All of this is really important. Whenever you feel that you are doing not enough, 
you are doing enough, you are doing a lot, and this is something that helps us to stay resilient. Thank you, Katerina. Um, I actually have a couple more questions, but I'm aware of the time, um, and I want to make sure that you all have a chance to ask questions. Do we have another microphone, or we can pass this out and pass this one around? Yes. Um, first, I want to say I was very impressed by the cross-section of people who are featured in your video and exhibit from different walks of life, different ethnic backgrounds. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how you found them and then how you selected them to be in your work. It's actually a very simple answer. I mean, we just used our private contacts first of all. Uh, so ask a friend, friend of a friend. And of course, we do have some of the stories here. Uh, Francis, uh, who knew already some of the stories, for example, uh, Igor, who is the, the man who walked 140 miles, already had shared his story before uh, with The Guardian. And he was a sort of a, a, a hero here already. So we <laughs> thought that, you know, if, if, if the exhibition comes to London, it would be just uh, somehow uh, stupid not to use the potential of have a cover boy, I, sorry for my... Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, uh, some other stories as well, because, you know, if you, if you, if you uh, talk with a friend who, who is helping Ukrainians, you know, he immediately said, okay, yes, we have one really interesting person here. And that's how we also met a couple of people in uh, Przemysza in, in Poland. We, we didn't actually have any contacts with them. We didn't have anything planned before. We just went there and we had one phone number. And you know, if, the, if we have a border city which has uh, uh, constantly like a six-figure uh, number of Ukrainians uh, there, so you know, the stories, there could be instead of 12 portraits, there could be 1,200, 12,000. I mean, these stories are on every corner. When I went to Izum, people came, you know, close to, you know, quite far east, uh, already not far from Donbass uh, border. People just came to me, wanted to share. I mean, uh, these, it, it's, it's, uh, it was important to us to, to represent something, uh, you know, bigger or wider in our very, very tiny selection. But I mean, it could be completely different selection and completely different stories. And I mean, for example, my very last day, I just have to share it. It's like maybe a full minute. But then on a very last day, 30, 40 kilometers from Bakhmut, I was just uh, filming this tank, uh, which is not a tank at uh, the very beginning of the film. And then a car stopped, by the way, with the British num plates with the wrong side uh, wheel. Uh, and, uh, and just uh, guys jumped out from the car and came to me and said, uh, Mine, you know, there are Mine. That is very funny. Uh, kind of, uh, you know, all, all like with kind of muddy faces and directly from Bakhmut. And, um, and so I said, oh, I'm all fine, don't worry, you know, I, I, I know. He is mines. Yeah, mines, yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, so I, I'm all fine, I'm already done with that. And then they started to take selfies with the tank. And then I said, you know, maybe I just help you guys, you know, you don't need to take selfies. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah. And then we started to chat and the guy, uh, you know, he didn't speak very good English. And then he switched to German. <laughs> and then uh, uh, he said, oh, yes. Uh, you know, I have a, actually a factory, or actually three factories, bakery factories, and I have 3,500 workers. He had two iPhones, and, yeah, and he came directly from Bakhmut, directly from the, the bloodiest fr uh, battlefront, and said, next time when you are coming, you know, I will be coming at the border to welcome you, this Lviv, uh, you know, uh, friendliness, like almost like oversaturated friendliness. And then he shared all the food they had, you know, gifts from old ladies, like a meat, canned meat and stuff like that. So we were there in the rain. The guys just had a lunch break uh, from Bakhmut. And uh, after 45 minutes, they went back there. They were special ops unit uh, who were driving the drones. So one guy is covering the back, one guy is flying, one guy is, you know, dropping the mines and stuff like that. So, and they, you know, this kind of a meeting. And Henry said that, Yes, uh, in February when it started, I just I had tickets to Switzerland to buy the croissant line to my factory, produce fifteen thousand croissants in a day. <laughs> so I mean, uh, okay, I mean, uh, uh, no more words needed. Yeah. Oh, any more questions? Um, well, I I had another question that I wanted to ask, which is about history, because uh, Francis, the curator, actually. Um, 
touches on history in, in the introduction um, to this exhibition, and I was extremely moved by the story from Ahmet, uh, the Crimean Tatar, who describes his uh, grandfather being deported from Crimea aged five, and then history repeating itself with Ahmet's daughter um, aged five, then um, needing to leave Crimea once more. Um, and I also, the, the fact that you um, tell the story of the more, you know, very, very recent history since 2014, this repetition where so many people have lost everything once and then lose it again. Um, and Francis uh, speaks about this idea of history repeating itself uh, in the introduction. And uh, history is obviously such an endless topic, um, but maybe something more specific that I wanted to ask related to history is you both as Estonians, whether um, a sense of shared history um, with Ukraine um, meant that you had a bit more of a connection to these historical layers that reach beyond the experience of the past years um, that's meant that you've connected in a different way to the people that you met in, in Ukraine and in the neighbouring countries. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, by the way, 24th of February, uh, the day, it's actually uh, the day of our independence in Estonia. So this is the day, uh, it's always free, uh, it's a national holiday, all the families are together, you know, spending time, having big lunches, dinners, really celebrating our independence. And then, you know, uh, what happened, it was the, the morning when we woke up and the, the war had broken out. Uh, we were all together with our families, except Kaupo, who was in the woods, <laughs> as I understood. So we will always remember that day. It, it's just, you know, it, it, it was supposed to be a nice celebration, but it turned out to be something completely different. Uh, but about the, the longer historical perspective, yes, of course, like uh, one of our characters is saying in 91, I voted Ukraine to get or yeah. to, to, to lead Soviet Union. Uh, that was the same with us. We had the singing revolution, what Kaupo mentioned already. Uh, we were occupied for 50 years. 1944 is a very important uh, and sad year for our history as well, uh, for all the Baltics uh, and so on. So, of course, we understand all this uh, history very well. And we had, uh, we had big deportations, 44, 49 thousands of Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians as well, were deported to Siberia, for example. So, yes, of course, it's, it's like... You know, it's, yeah, history is repeating and uh, we still have, uh, like, grandmothers, grandfathers who are telling uh, the war stories from the 40s. It's not some, something we don't remember and read from history books. It's, it's a living, living uh, history. Uh, and I, I have to say that um, over the past year, especially, I have really noticed a difference uh, between British friends and family of mine and uh, various colleagues and friends that I have from Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, Poland in particular, where people just understood absolutely immediately after the full-scale invasion, well, you know, the, the nature of the enemy and why trying to negotiate with Russia is uh, absolutely absurd and, um, mm. and, you know, knew straight away that we needed to be giving weapons to Ukraine and supporting Ukraine to fight um, as, as strongly as possible uh, against Russia. And um, Katerina, I was just, I was wondering whether you have anything to add here, whether um, the, the extent to which today feels like a repetition of uh, centuries long um, anti-imperial struggle that Ukraine has had and to what extent it feels like something completely different over the past year and a half. I do love what uh, Sasha Dolchik, the deputy director of Ukrainian Institute in London have said back on the on the big meeting and rally in front of Russian embassy on the February 24, year after the full invasion, full scale invasion started, she that said this going to be the last war of you bastards. And what did she say, motherfuckers? And what she meant is probably the second option actually. I edited it myself. Sorry. What she meant is to not to have the history repeated again and again and again. It has to be. Acknowledged 
recognized, seen, and talking about. We were just starting recognizing the genocide of Crimean Tatars. I won't probably mistake saying that British or not post-Soviet people in the audience do not really know what had happened to them during the Second World War. So hundreds of thousands of Crimean Tatars were deported somewhere to Siberia from Crimea during a couple of nights. What would you take? Like they took nothing, they did not have a chance. All the peninsula, the huge area, people who lived there for centuries had to abandon their homes and go to Siberia like this. Children, with, I mean, they were not able to take their dogs and cats back then, and just, just like that. Uh, a lot of people died on the way, obviously, they were not traveling in the luxurious conditions, and the way is long, as you can imagine. Couple of weeks by train for cattle. We have just started recognizing that and talking about that. Nobody really knew this had happened. We had just started talking about Holodomor. We still yet to talk about different other scenes that Soviet Union, so Russian Emperor and back then Soviet Union and just now Russia has been doing to Ukraine for centuries. We are still sometimes encountering this kind of narrative that, well, historically half of Ukraine is Russian speaking. Historically, some people are knowing only Russian. They were made to be like that historically, for ages, literally, for centuries. Starting from the back years ago of Soviet Empire. For instance, my surname is Babkina, which some of you can recognize as kind of Russian surname. However, my grandfather's parents' surname was Babko. They were from Donbass. This is the part of Ukraine claimed to be historically Russian-speaking and more pro-Russian. So, they were uh, living there, having a surname Babko, which is very original Ukrainian and did this core thing. But when their children were born, they felt safer to sign them as a Babkine, so they have a better future. Ukrainian language was forbidden a number of times. Sometimes people were like killed or imprisoned for speaking or writing in that. Sometimes they were just not accepted to schools and whatsoever. And we have finally to acknowledge this and to talk about it and to see that by ourselves and to be seen too. So this is finally the time when we call the scenes by their real name. We call the genocide the genocide, we call the rape rape, we call the murder murder, we call the crime crime. We are not trying to rape it in a beautiful paper, we are not trying to make it more acceptable. We are not negotiating with Russia anymore. This gives us a hope. It's not going to repeat. Thank you. Very well said, Katarina. Um, I think we've probably got time for one more question. If, if anybody, yes. Thank you, Katarina. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I just thought, like, when you film of those people telling the stories, did it? How did you emotionally cope with the thought that potentially this could be last recording of whatever they had to say to the world or another human being? And did it make you think, what would you take? Um, we had around one or two hours for every person, which is not a lot. Sometimes I make a film for five years. <laughs> And now you go, you met someone, and you meet someone, and you just have this very limited time and space to spend with. But as they were um, prepared for this interview, like whoever, Kaupo or somewhere else who helped us, had explained what is the concept of, of the project, that it's not that we're going to ask about their whole life experiences, that it's really this story of escape and and the object. Each one of them brought this one object, what they don't wanted to talk about. So the 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 opening up or the um, the trust it, it happened 
immediately, which is not the case usually. Uh, they were ready to, to tell their stories and, and to be photographed as well. Mm, of course, there were some more harder interviews, um, for example, the Mariupol ones, both of them uh, were really difficult. Like you could see Igor with a, with a dog. He did not look into our eyes at all. Like he was just, he, he, he's of course a very shy guy as well. And suddenly being the, the star of the Guardian hasn't, <laughs> hasn't been something he expected to happen in his life, but still. He was ready to speak with us, but he didn't look in our eyes at all. And, and the other old guy, Victor, who unfortunately has died now um, of cancer, uh, seeing him explaining the details of these two weeks in Mariupol was... It, it was very, very difficult and difficult not to you know, we have to keep ourselves, not to start kind of a discussion or saying when you're, at least me as a filmmaker, just have to listen <laughs> and let the person talk. And, the, and his um, wife was present as well. Uh, and she said, no, 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 I don't want to be filmed. Uh, I've become so ugly in these months, which she wasn't. She was just an old, old woman, but she felt that I'm, I'm, I'm grey, I've, I've uh, uh, cried so much, I'm emotionally so broken, I don't want to be filmed. Uh, but my husband, he's ready to be filmed. So basically they were both in the room and, and telling the story, but, uh, but only we can see the, the husband. Uh, and when we uh, now contacted each one of them to, to tell about the, the opening and, and about the film, then uh, unfortunately she said that uh, Victor has died, but he was so much willing to share the story that uh, I, I would be happy that he, if he's still in the film. So, um, so yeah, but, but I would say we also had some very funny moments. And also what you can see, this kind of a humor in, in most difficult situations, you can find kind of self-ironic, you know, um, happenings. Um, so I try to balance this in the film as well, that, uh, that you would have all kinds of emotions. And the, the photographer, Tata, she, she said very well that uh, I was ready for the worst. And what actually happened was that I experienced only good things. Mm. So, yes, very different experiences. Uh, I just now do a very risky thing, and I just want to tie this to tie this together and to say that uh, we have been very much on this kind of a negative side. But I mean, this is not a negative exhibition. Also, the film is not negative. I mean, you you see and you hear bad things, and you all have the background stories. You you don't need any i mean but these are these are heroes i mean our angle and my angle was always to choose the rather beauty uh, instead of the the terror and rather silent quiet voice instead of the shouting instead of the provoking voice which is so dominant in the arts i mean whichever newspaper you open today you will see the provoking uh, aggressive stuff so I mean, I try to approach your souls uh, from the much softer spot in a much uh, sincere and honest way. Uh, and I believe actually that this soft spot uh, is now m less exploited and more open than everything else around that. So I mean, it's, there, is, there is a lot of beauty. Uh, all these people are luckily uh, safe. Of course, unfortunately, Victor, we, we knew already then that it might happen. It was a, it's a, again, very dramatic story, but I mean, for all of them, this, what would you take, ended up well. And we just now hope that it will have a kind of a happy ending, as however happy it can be, but I, I mean, for, for all of us in, all together. So, I mean, 
uh, however uh, dark stuff uh, it was uh, before, then I really want to also put this kind of uh, sticker of hope and beauty and and all this good stuff here on top of and seal it. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Cal, for yeah. that's a fantastic note to end on. And as Katarina said as well, the repetition of history is not inevitable. And um, thank you all for being here and, and for your support. Um, thank you to the European Parliament Liaison Office for hosting this exhibition and this event this evening, and the Embassy of Estonia too. Um, and I would also like to uh, mention that on the Ukrainian Institute London's website on our homepage, we have a link uh, to a page that we've put together of the different charities that we recommend donating to, um, the, the, to, to support on the ground in Ukraine and other ways that you can support Ukraine at this time. Um, so please do take a look at that and continue supporting in all of the ways that you can. Um, and uh, please do follow the Ukrainian Institute London as well. We're an independent charity. We hold a range of uh, talks and discussions and cultural events. Next week, we're actually hosting Serhi Jadan, who was uh, one of the leading Ukrainian writers and activists. Um, he will be giving a talk on Monday and uh, his rock band, rock ska punk band, will be playing at Battersea Art Centre next Wednesday, uh, which is another time just to come together and, um, and feel this solidarity. Uh, so please do follow us and thank you again for coming and thank you to our wonderful team. <laughs>